Welcome to another discussion on the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Dana Pike. I'm a professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University in Provo, and I'm joined today by three of my colleagues, all of whom are likewise from the Department of Ancient Scripture. Professor Eric Huntsman, Professor Kent Brown, and Professor David Whitchurch. Nice to be here with the three of you. Today we're talking about, we're in the Old Testament, we're talking about the first six chapters of Ezra. And this is actually really exciting material, I think. Some, some folks might not think exciting thoughts when they hear the name Ezra. Uh, I think we really need to make a few comments about the book itself, and then we need to do a few comments on the, the history, the geography, where we are uh, in the setting of things. Uh, but let me make a couple of comments about the book. Ezra is 10 chapters long falls nicely into two portions. Chapter one through six, which we're talking about today, deals with Israelites, Jewish people, we'd say, who had been taken to Babylon, are now allowed to return sometime in the early 530s. Uh, they rebuild the temple, and that's dedicated, finished and dedicated in 515 BC. So we've got two to two and a half decades uh, of time covered here in the book. Chapter seven through 10, focus on Ezra the person and his mission to Jerusalem and his activity as a priest in Jerusalem in the mid 400s. And so there are two entirely different chronological time periods, five, late 500s, mid 400s. A lot of times we'll hear people say, Ezra returned or went from Babylon to Jerusalem and built the temple. Right. When Ezra gets there, the temple's been built for half a century. So with that in mind, we're doing uh, this activity in, in the, the first six chapters of Ezra. So help, help me out here. What, what do we need to know to appreciate what's going on in Ezra 1 through 6? Well, first we need to put it in the context of, of world events at the time. And of course, the Jews at this point were under the domination of the Persian Empire which had taken over from the Babylonians. So we start with the reign of Cyrus, the quite famous king of Persia, in okay. verse 1. And what do we need to know even before we get to <coughs> Cyrus, Kent? Well, certainly we need to know something about these people who return. And all the people who one time lived in that country, the fall of Jerusalem was really a major watershed in history. And it literally cut people from their moorings. So that those people who return feel a drawback but there's a large population that remains in Babylonia because they felt now displaced from their old homeland. And uh, we know that the uh, Jews ended up in, in, uh, in Egypt and other places like this okay. and made their homes <clears throat> there. It's been 50 years now. They've settled in. Mm -hmm. They've got family connections in, in occupations. occupations. Okay. And, okay. and so when the call comes to return to Jerusalem, it's a difficult decision to make, and right. many will stay behind. So the Babylonians destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in 586. People had been deported a decade earlier as well as in the 580s. And now, 539, we have Cyrus and the Persians conquering the Babylonian Empire, and they are now the dominant power in the ancient Near Eastern world, the, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Middle East is what we would call it today. And so when we begin Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, it says, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So we're right, right early on in the beginning, uh, 539, maybe moving into 538. It's worth noting that Ezra picks up historically in the account here the same place that the book of Second Chronicles ends. And in fact, the language in the last couple of verses of Second Chronicles is essentially repeated in the first couple of verses of the book of Ezra. And it tells us that in chapter 1, verse 1, just as the Lord had prophesied through the prophet Jeremiah decades earlier, back in Jerusalem, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, put it into writing, and sent it out. And I can see that some of us are already turning to Isaiah, chapters 44 and 45. And probably this is a good time to, to go to Isaiah 44, verse 28, 45. the last verse in chapter 44, and then the first verse of Isaiah 45. Similar contents, famous prophecies. I know Ezra 1, 1 says the math of Jeremiah. He must have said something about we, this as you know, well. Jer Jeremiah talks about the 70 years and how the, uh, of captivity. The Lord would bring and, back and, and so you assume that somehow that 70 years, we're getting close to that uh, period. Uh, it's been 50 years, and now things begin to happen to restore uh, Judah back mm -hmm. to Jerusalem. Okay. 
So who wants to read 44.28 for us? I'm going to take that. Okay. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Interesting language, proclaiming a Gentile king as the shepherd of his people. Okay. And it continues <clears throat> to become more interesting. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, Okay, this is chapter 45, mm -hmm. verse 1. Yeah. Whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him two leaved gates. And then it goes on and talks about how he is going to be able to be in a position to free not just the Jewish people, but we know from historical texts, many different peoples who had been subjugated by the <coughs> Babylonians. All right. It's probably significant to note that Isaiah's prophecy is 140 years before Cyrus is born, mm -hmm. uh, before Cyrus uh, at least develops his empire. Um, so to be able to read that, now we're going back, I and mean, we've looked at Isaiah, now we're going the other direction. We look at uh, Ezra, and we actually see here is the, the individual account of what who was no appointed. Those of us who accept predictive prophecy, I mean, some okay. scholars have headaches Absolutely. over that. All right. So God, through his foreknowledge on numerous occasions in Scripture, announces the names of people who won't be born for, for years or centuries, and that's an example of that. I like the point that you just made, that is, that, that when the Lord moves his own purposes, there are not only those who receive directly his blessing, but there's this ripple, this rollout that affects other people as well. So that the freeing of the Jewish people in, in Babylonia means the freeing and the blessing of others elsewhere. I think that's really important. That is, and I think that's where we, what we need to develop right now. If we go back to Ezra chapter 1, uh, we actually have an account of what mm -hmm. King Cyrus's proclamation was to the Jewish people who had been uh, conquered and deported. Ezra 1 verse 2, David, you want to read that for us, please? Actually, it continues on after that. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord of uh, Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. How far did you want me to well, take that? Well, it goes another it's verse, but that's probably good for our purposes. <coughs> Sometimes uh, I've, I've been in discussions where people have read this and said, wow, isn't that amazing that the Lord here, all in caps, meaning Jehovah, right, singled out the Israelites that had been deported mm -hmm. to, to Babylon, and now he's causing the Persians, Cyrus, the king of Persia, to, to let the Israelites, the Jews, go back. As a special dispensation. As if, favor, as if that happened them. all to them as a special favor. While I accept that it happened, we need to appreciate that this happens in a much bigger historical context. There, a famous inscription found a number of years ago called the Cyrus Cylinder. It's a it's clay. It's like a football with the ends cut off, a, a clay cylinder. The Cyrus Cylinder is an inscription dated to 539, found in Babylon. I just want to read a couple of lines for it. This is... Uh, prepared by the scribes of Cyrus the Persian king. And it says Marduk, he's the chief god of the Babylonians at that time, mm -hmm. scanned and looked through all the country searching for a righteous leader who would rule him in the annual festivals. Uh, Marduk looked over all the earth and proclaimed the name of Cyrus to be the great king. And then further on in the inscription, Cyrus says, and this is the part we want. As to the regions from Ashur and Susa, Agad, Eshnunna, the Gutians, all the area north of Babylon and east of Babylon, uh, on the other side of the Tigris, he said, I return to their cities uh, on the other side of the Tigris, which had been in ruins for a long time, the images, the idol statues, right, which used to live there and, and were taken by the Babylonians, and established them for them permanent sanctuaries. So he rebuilt temples for these other people, sent their religious uh, idols back. And he says, I also gathered all their inhabitants and returned them to their habitations. May they all pray for well, me. This was a really astute political sure. policy um, because the Assyrians and the Babylonians had tended to deport people and their gods. They destroyed the temples but take, as you read there, the images to, to Babylon or to Nineveh. And so Cyrus is sending home to peoples to their ancestral homelands and to let them take their gods with them. Now, of course, the Jews didn't have an image of Jehovah, right. but we see a lot of attention given to the vessels and the different implements at the temple From that the had temple. been carried away that are yes. taken back. Yes. I think that's interesting. As Kent said, we have no doubt that the Spirit moved Cyrus to do this, ultimately to help the Jews. 
But a lot of times, the Lord blesses as many children of His children as He can, and other people benefit from it. I know you've said that you use sure. the example of the fall of the Iron Curtain. Uh, I do, yeah, in the early 1990s, that uh, many political analysts wouldn't think that that happened so that uh, the true missionaries of the Lord could take the restored gospel to the peoples of Eastern Europe. But I think that was one of the major reasons that that happened. But other blessings and other opportunities for many peoples opened up as well there. So the Lord, I think here, again, not singling out the Jews, but but bringing about historical activity to accomplish his purposes. The Jewish people are one of many that are benefiting from this, but the focus obviously in the Bible is on the covenant people of the Lord. Kent, is there something you want to add to that? No, I've, I think that uh, we really have sewn this up. I, I think uh, um, that the, the idea of God inserting his hand into human affairs is, is a wondrously rich kind of study and here we see it, and we see its benefits. And as, as you read from the Cyrus Cylinder, we can see how others were sort of carried with this wonderful wave right. of blessing. Yeah. Yeah. And we see this kind of activity prophesied in the book of Daniel and Ezekiel and others, that the Lord will work among the nations to gather his people. We often think of the gathering at the last days, and that's certainly a valid understanding of that. But here we're seeing this uh, historically back in the late 500s. Well, we probably should move on. In chapter 1, we hear verse 7, Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels out of the house that had been taken from the Jerusalem temple of Jehovah by Nebuchadnezzar, the, the Babylonian king, decades earlier, and appoints a fellow at the end of verse 8 named Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. As far as we can tell, who is this fellow and how does he play out here in the book of Ezra at the beginning? He's the son of, of the last rightful king of Judah, Jehoiakim. Kin or Chin, so that's okay. pronounced. Uh, the one that was taken off in the first deportation replaced by Zedekiah. So this is someone of the Davidic family All right. that the people would have looked to as someone who was a rightful ruler okay. or leader. And so he's given charge to help restore some of the people and the temple vessels back to Jerusalem. Part of, part of the miraculous dimension of this is the fact that all of this wealth which is taken out of the, the the storage rooms in Babylon and moved to Jerusalem, that it all makes it there mm -hmm. intact. If you, th if you think of that much territory, that, that many hundred miles these, these people traveled, mm -hmm. carrying these vessels, these valuable pieces, and that they weren't attacked and things weren't stolen, it's really, really remarkable that uh, somehow there's this gift of protection that, that follows them. We don't see it in the story, right. but it certainly is underneath yeah. the story. You know, you know, it really has to say something about Cyrus and who he was. I mean, he really did feel some kind of calling to establish these peoples, and as you say, other nations as well, back. But it's not just restoring them, it's restoring these, these holy artifacts that belong to the temple and, and worth who knows how much. Yeah, the Persians definitely have a different foreign policy compared to their predecessors, and I always call it the Mary Poppins principle, a spoonful of sugar will help the medicine go down. <laughs> we'll, we'll send you back and you pray for us and pay your taxes, everything will be okay. If you don't, they could be just as mean as anybody else, but I do believe that the Spirit of the Lord is moving upon him to help accomplish this work, as, as prophesied earlier by Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and others. Well, we get to chapter 2, and we get a long list of the names of people who return, and, and we're going to say return regularly. Some of these people, some of these Jewish or Israelite folks that are going from Babylon to Jerusalem are actually born in exile. Um, so some of them are returning. Some of them were born in exile and are coming to Jerusalem, their, their ancestral homeland, for the first time. There's a, there would be a mix of, of those gr two groups of people. By this time, chapter 2, verse 2, we hear specifically two names that are important to us for the rest of our discussion today. Zerubbabel, in fact, his name means seed of Babylon. He's apparently born in Babylon. And Jeshua, uh, mentioned right after him, Zerubbabel is going to be appointed the governor of Jerusalem and Judah, right? Because there's no kingdom of Judah anymore. This is a province as part of the greater Persian Empire. And Jeshua is going to, does function, he's a priest, a descendant of Aaron, so he'll function as the Aaronic high priest in the city. So we have and a political and a religious leader. He's, um, described as Joshua, just to kind of keep those yes. straight with some of our yeah, other readings. In, in, in the book of Haggai, it's Joshua. In the book of Ezra, he's called Jeshua. And Two different name forms of the same name. It's probably useful as well to keep in mind that uh, Zerubbabel is also uh, 
in the line of the kings that mm -hmm. it's mentioned in Matthew okay. that Jesus is descended from that line. Through Jehoiakim, the king who was taken away in 597. Exactly. And, and this would be a, a Zerubbabel yeah. as well, that okay. there's this line yes. that's coming down. So you have a, a civil magistrate of sorts okay. as well as a yes. priestly magistrate that are working in tandem to establish right. the temple there. So there's no Davidic king right now, but Zerubbabel exactly. is of the Davidic lineage. He's the governor, the political ruler in and around Jerusalem, but again, under the uh, domination of the Persians. It's interesting, the rest of this chapter, you have one of these long lists that we tend to just quickly read through or skip altogether. Uh, but this was very important for the returning community to be able to trace their individual lineage through families that had yes. been deported. Yes. Uh, in fact, it seems that the returning exiles kind of established themselves in Palestine Palestine as an aristocracy. Not everyone was deported. And we know that there are people called people of the land. The peasants, Jeremiah tells us, were left in the land. But these people come back, and if they can trace themselves through these families, that makes them important. They've got claims to ownership of the land. But you also have particular groups that are focused upon the priest in verses 36 to 39, the Levites in 4 through 42, other families associated with the temple or with government. And, and these are very interesting. Uh, these people are very interesting to the editor who's putting this material together with Ezra's own writings yes. because it establishes the groups that he thinks are important to restore a true community well, of the Lord. And they're going back with the a royal mandate as well as a, a religious desire to build a temple, and they need priesthood to officiate at the temple. Just before we leave chapter 2, because we really do want to talk about building, rebuilding the temple, chapter 2, verse 61, and the next several verses through 63, we hear about some people who claim to be priests, and this yeah. is often utilized by Latter-day Saints and to, to illustrate the significance of keeping your family history, uh, the significance of genealogy. They claim to be priests, verse 62, chapter 2, verse 62, these sought their register among those who were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. They couldn't find their their priestly lineage. And so they were considered uh, as polluted and put out from the priesthood. Or in other words, they weren't allowed to officiate in, in priestly functions. And so uh, we have that emphasized. I think, I think it's in, oh, go ahead, Ken. It looked like you wanted to say something. I, I wasn't quite thinking back on that. I was actually going to okay. pick up something else. It comes up in the last verse where we read that these people arrive in Jerusalem, but not all of, not all of them settle in the city. Notice that we read the priests and Levites, some of the people, singers, porters, Nethanims, dwelt in their cities mm -hmm. and all Israel in their cities. This becomes a problem later because the population of Jerusalem is not s sufficient to maintain itself properly. Uh, there actually is, uh, in a later era, uh, uh, going around saying, okay, every tenth person, uh, every tenth family is supposed to move, to come back. move back yeah. into the city. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so not everybody comes back to the city and settles there, but they go out to old ancestral lands outside of town, and, uh, and that creates something of a problem. Just one thing okay. as we move into rebuilding the temple in verse 63, the governor, the Tershatha, says, we don't have a genealogy, we're going to take you off the list until there is a priest with the Urim and Thummim, and I think right. that's interesting. We're going to have prophets, we're going to have priests that can establish the temple rituals, but we get the sense that some things are missing from the way it used to be. Yes. We yes. don't have the Ark of the Covenant. We don't have the Urim and Thummim. We don't yes. have all the guidance that we need from this point on. Good point. That brings us to chapter 3, and we have 3 through 6 now to talk about uh, for the rest of the time we're together. Uh, in chapter 3, we hear again verse 2, Then stood up, or arose, Jeshua, who is with the high priest, the Aaronic priesthood, Zerubbabel, who is again a Davidic descendant, the political governor. And they built the altar of the God of Israel and began to offer burnt offerings thereon, according to the law of Moses. And according to the law, there was a burnt offering offered on behalf of all of Israel in the morning and the mm -hmm. evening, every day of the year, every year, year after year. And so there's this even though the city hasn't even been rebuilt. We know that the walls are destroyed, some of the gates still from the Babylonian destruction in the 580s. Their intent when they get there, at least the focus of the text, is we want to reestablish this priestly sacrificial activity as part of our worship to Jehovah to involve Him in our lives. Kent? And, and, this was, and this, of course, was to adjust, if you will, or perhaps even replace, what evidently had been going on even since the fall of the city. There's evidence from Jeremiah chapter 40 that, that or I guess it's 41, where there are northerners from Samaria who are still traveling down to worship in the city. The, even though the main body of survivors had left Jerusalem, they're actually living in a town north of there called Mitzpah, um, that there apparently has been worship 
taken, taking place at the side of the sanctuary, at the side of the altar, but now it becomes regularized yeah. with priesthood. And it seems to me that that is a major step. Well, and it's, it's interesting to note as you look at this that the first thing that they do is it's not get the temple built and then we'll start offering sacrifice. Right. It's let's restore the sacrifices. That becomes right. absolutely crucial Good. to them. Yes. You see almost something similar in the Restoration. <coughs> we go out and teach the gospel and organize branches and people have the sacrament. They have their regular church meetings. But then the next push is to get them ready to go to the temple, to build them a temple. And so you see this kind of cumulative. So that, those basic principles of faith, obedience, sacrifice. Well, and, and, and I like what, what it is that pushes them towards this. In verse 3, he says that they're setting up the altar for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. There's, there's a, this is hard times. We're, mm -hmm. we're coming back good. into some dangerous territory. Mm -hmm. And number one is we've got to Get establish right that link right. with the right. Lord and, and right. get things in order the right. way they ought to be, as we should in our own lives. Right. So in chapter 3, verse 6, we hear that, the, the, again, the sacrifices are being offered, but the foundation of the temple hadn't been laid yet. Verse 8, we hear that in the next year, in the second year after they've returned, Cyrus took over 539. We guess they probably returned 538, 537. We don't know for sure, but now in the second year, they're there. They push forward again with the leadership religiously and politically, and we know some prophetic involvement as well, to lay the foundations of the temple. So chapter 3, verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in apparel, there are trumpets, there are Levitical choirs. Verse 11, everybody is singing in courses, praising and giving thanks unto the Lord. Verse 11 in the middle, and all the people shouted with a great shout, and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. This must have been a wonderful uh, yeah. uh, celebration. Yeah, sure. Was that a shout? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, think of that. Now, this is the ceremonial beginning of all of this. Yeah. It's a wonderful time. Yeah. In fact, just previous, yeah. previous to that, they're talking about instituting the Feast of Tabernacles, which has that Hosanna yeah. shout yeah. concept right. built yes. into it. So well, we, great joyous time. Good, good. We think that things are going well, but in chapter 4, we hear there are some adversaries, some of the, well, who are these adversaries we hear about in 4.1? <laughs> well, it seems as though at least some of those who have to be counted in this number are Samaritans, okay. people from the north. These people have been coming down to the sanctuary, as we learned from the book of Jeremiah. Or the ruins of the sanctuary. Uh, the ruins of the sanctuary, and have continued to offer sacrifice there to their God. These people now come, offer their help, and they're rebuffed. And one sense is here, one of those little points that is inserted into the relationship between these people um, and, <clears throat> and those living in Jerusalem, that is, those from the north and those living in Jerusalem. And this, this is one of those points that will eventually grow into a big chasm, which we see in the New Testament era between Samaritans on the one hand and the people of Jerusalem on the other. And this is one of those beginning points. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And so since they're rebuffed, they try, they to, frustrate they the try to frustrate the work, and we hear that they're successful. They appeal to the king. And the, the Persian king. So the Persian they, king. they send off a letter uh, and in they stop the building. Now, by the time that that letter is sent, Cyrus is probably not uh, as involved in this. So um, they allow the work to get stopped. Yeah. And we read in chapter 4, verse 24, the end of that chapter, then ceased the work of or on the house of God at Jerusalem. It ceased until the second year of the reign of King Darius. Now, Darius becomes king in 522. So that means down to about 520. There's probably 15 or so years that go by here when, according to Ezra, the account in Ezra, that no the adversaries, the opponents to these people uh, tend to halt the progress. Chapter 5, verse 1, we're introduced to two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. So at this, this community of uh, covenant Israelites in the late 500s, we have four dominant individuals, Jeshua or Joshua the priest, Zechariah, not Zechariah, Zerubbabel, <laughs> Zerubbabel the governor, and yes. then Haggai and Zechariah the prophets. Uh, we now hear that the prophets are involved to encourage the building of the temple. Mm -hmm. We will spend a separate section on Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, in, in, in another discussion, we'll, we'll deal with the books. But here we see them functioning in the narrative of the text. And we're told that, uh, again, uh, things aren't quite ready to roll. Uh, unless you have anything to say, I think we better move to chapter 6. Um, 
Darius the king is appealed, an appeal is made to him. He searches the uh, royal archives. They find that Cyrus did say yes, build this they, temple. There had been a royal edict to, to build the temple, um, and so he reinstitutes that proclamation. Darius, of course, came to power in 522. So that gives us now another mark, right? Uh, and we'll see that Haggai and Zechariah fit into this into this time frame. Right. And it really does help uh, when you, when you're reading the scriptures. You find that you move between two verses and you've lost 20 years of history. Yes. Or you it's go a, between chapter note. four and five, and it, well, it's and you just don't understand it's why okay. Zechariah and Haggai are so upset about the lack of progress. But when you realize there have been 15 ten years, to 15 years then have you gone understand by. why. Exactly. It felt right. so strongly about it. So chapter six, verse 14: The elders of the Jews build it, and they prospered through the prophesying the encouragement of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah who's also the prophet they builded and finished the temple verse 15 this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar which is in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king so we typically say 515 this second temple in Jerusalem was finished it was dedicated as we move to the end of the chapter we hear they're celebrating Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and I think we're going to just finish with chapter 6, verse 22. They kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, celebrating the, uh, the, the completion and the dedication of the temple, and it says, uh, for the Lord had made them joyful mm -hmm. and had strengthened their hands in the work of the house of, the, of God. Feast of Unleavened Bread, of course, is associated with Passover. So here these people are celebrating their freedom, as it were, in a Passover ceremony which is exactly the right touch. So they've been freed from Egypt historically, now yeah. they've been freed from Babylon. That's and their freedom's right. not official till the temple's done. Yeah, right. because that, that's the establishment of the spiritual freedom too. And that says something about the role of temples in our lives as well. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.